it's a real pleasure to have uh, Doug Ao from the University of Washington speaking to us. Uh, he's going to be telling us about private convex optimization by the exponential mechanism, which is relevant to a lot of things that people here care about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so it's my honor today to present uh, our recent work on private convex optimization. Uh, this is joint work with Gopi, uh, who is also present uh, from Microsoft, and my advisor in Tali. Um, in the beginning, I just try to use one sentence to summarize our main contribution. That uh, we found that adding regularization terms in exponential mechanism can lead to optimal algorithms for both DPIM and uh, DPSCO. Um, briefly, my uh, my talk today will focus on the first two parts about DPERM and the DPSCO separately. Uh, at the uh, final end, uh, at the end of the talk, I will briefly cover our results on the efficient sampling. Okay. So, uh, in the beginning, let me uh, just record the definition of the differential privacy and the empirical risk minimization. So given two neighboring data sets, can you find the difference in these two uh, data sets? Mm, some, yeah, there's a clever duck says, oh, that's easy, cannot be easier. So the first one contains a banana, but the second one contains an apple. So what do we want a private algorithm to do? So that's it. So in some sense, given the two neighboring data sets and we run the private algorithms on them uh, and get two outputs. Now, if we still find the clever duck to find the difference, we hope to hear some answer like this. Oh no, is there any difference? Maybe. So in some sense, we hope uh, the private algorithm can have similar outputs with similar data sets then it make it hard to find the difference in the data sets. So more formally, we say an um, algorithm is epsilon data dp if for any event and any neighboring data sets, d and d prime, uh, the following equation holds. OK, hope everybody should be familiar with the definition. Now uh, let's continue to the empirical risk minimization. So in the class, Classic setting, uh, we try to minimize the following function, uh, which is the average of uh, n risk function over n users. And uh, we may assume the function is convex in X. Uh, so this is the classic ERM. So on the DP constraint, we just want our algorithm to be DP to approximately minimize the uh, capital F. And we say D and D prime are neighboring if they only differ in one single user. Is the definition clear? Okay. Um, to distinguish the risk in ERM and the risk in uh, DPSO, I will talk later. So I just give a name for the risk in ERM. So I refer to the following term to excess, excess, excess empirical risk. So if I'm talking about empirical risk, I mean, so I'm talking about DPERM. And then the problem is how did people solve DPERM previously? Um, so one classic way is by the exponential mechanism. So this is one of the first mechanism invented in DP and now it's used almost everywhere. And the mechanism itself is very clean. You just get a sample uh, from density E to the minus KF. Um, the only assumption we need is just, we need the function has bounded sensitivity. So recall the uh, capital F is the average of n function. So there is a scalar n here. We choose k to be something n epsilon over two delta. Uh, by the by, a simple analysis, we can show this mechanism is epsilon zero dp. And by a standard way, 
uh, to bound the utility. So we can show uh, the risk is bounded by the following term. Oh, I will also briefly discuss how we get this in the sampling literature later. One of the biggest um, uh, one of the biggest advantage of the exponential mechanism is that, is that we don't even need a function to be convex. The only assumption is the bounded sensitivity. So that's um, over some assumption. As in practice, we cannot always hope our functions to be convex, right? But uh, one drawback is the linear dependence on the dimension D. So usually our machine learning models uh, are in high dimension dimensions are always large. The linear dependence seems a little annoying. Can we do better? So, so any problem uh, regarding with exponential mechanism? Uh, so I think uh, uh, the classic use is in the discrete size, the domain, some discrete thing, you choose something. But now we just apply it in the continuous domain. So but everything should be similar. OK. So now uh, I will continue. Uh, can we do better? So just a question. Uh, actually, uh, there are many previously uh, exciting results, but only need some mild assumption. So we assume the function is convex and the GDP is. Uh, luckily, we don't need to function to be smooth. Uh, also, we are considering this problem in a bounded compact domain, convex domain uh, with diameter D. So this is a classic convex optimization problem. Under these mild assumptions, one can do much better. So how much better? That's it. So the first row uh, is about exponential mechanism, and you see the linear dependence on D. And in the second row, you see uh, by some noise SGD, one can do uh, saving uh, a square root D term. As a trade-off, uh, we get a the privacy guarantee a little bit worse. Uh, so in the exponential mechanism, you get a pure DP. The delta can be zero, but for the noise SGD, uh, or in the approximate DP, the delta should be strictly larger than zero. So there's a trade-off. You just uh, get a slightly worse privacy guarantee, but you get a much better uh, bond on the empirical risk. And uh, note, these two uh, terms are tight in PDP and uh, approximate DP, uh, respectively. Mm -hmm. OK. So how do people do the noise SGD? So recall, we add some extra assumption that uh, the function is Lipschitz. So that's why we need Lipschitz here, because we can bound the sensitivity on the gradient or subgradient. So we just do noisy SGD as following. You just choose the uh, appropriate uh, batch size, the good variance uh, of the Gaussian, then you, you are done. The privacy analysis follows directly by some standard uh, or well-known techniques in the DP literature, say uh, privacy amplification, uh, composition, or moments of content, so those stuff. Uh, as for the utility, the UTT also follows uh, by some standard analysis of SGD. So as SGD is very robust, adding uh, some Gaussian will not influence uh, a lot. So that's it. Hmm, looks good, right? But there is still one question may be uh, raised by many people. So as the exponential mechanism is so clean and so powerful, it's used almost everywhere. But the one drawback is that uh, the gap we, the bound we get 
by exponential mechanism is usually in pure DP. And as we see, there are usually a large gap between the tight bounds between pure DP and the apportionate DP. So it, it's private enough to get an apportionate DP algorithm. So can we just modify or generalize the exponential mechanism to get something good and powerful in pure DP or in proximate DP, sorry? Uh, that's the question. At least for the DPEM, we should answer it. We want to answer it. So in this work, we give a positive answer. Yes. How? Uh, very simple. Just add an L2 to, to L2 square regularizer to the object function. We learn this uh, mechanism regularize exponential mechanism or reaching for brevity. So more formally, this is the uh, statement I copy from our paper here. So uh, let k be the compensate with diameter d, the function convex. Uh, it's notable that we only assume the difference between two functions is g Lipschitz. This is slightly weaker than the assumption that g is Lipschitz itself. Uh, most of previous uh, work on the, this uh, problem need the function to be g Lipschitz. Um, and also we just sample x according to this uh, regularized function. We get epsilon delta dp and with a small expected excess empirical risk. Hmm. Any problems so far? Okay. Um the utility bound also follows standardly uh, by previous techniques. And uh, our main contribution is the privacy guarantee of our region. So now I will uh, focus on the privacy analysis first. Actually, um, the privacy guarantee of our region follows from this abstract theorem. So you can see yeah, some T di F minus F is GDP something stuff, which is corresponding to the uh, assumptions we need in DPERA. Okay. Um, the strongly convex means the function is some equals to some convex function plus some uh, L2 square. Okay. Just a quick remind. So, this uh, theorem says uh, the P and the Q, the two distributions are at least as private as two Gaussians. So the privacy curve is a function over the epsilon. So that's for any fixed value of epsilon was the smallest delta you can get to say X and Y are epsilon delta dp. So in some sense, you can just try, try try to treat it as a distance between P and Q. So like the Watson-Stern, like the Ren-Yi divergence, KL divergence, this is some kind of uh, distance to for the epsilon delta dp uh, purpose. And we can bound the distance. They are close in this distance. Uh, actually, our bound is tight. Uh, this includes a Gaussian mechanism as a special case, say, uh, f and the tilde f are two quadratic functions, then the difference is a linear function whose Lipschitz constant is uh, a over sigma square. Um, the strong convexity is uh, straightforward. So actually, p and q are two Gaussians with the same uh, covariance, but different mean. Then with a quick uh, calculation, you can show the privacy curve between P and Q is exactly what we stated in the theory. Okay, so any problems so far? So 
I have a question. So if we, like, I'm kind of curious, like, what is the role of the strong convexity assumption? So obviously it's sort of essential for a Gaussian, but if oh, you, you were to relax that somehow, is there any way you would get you know, the equivalent of Laplace noise or something like that if you change that assumption? Oh, so you mean why do we need the function to be strongly convex? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just sort of wondering, like, is there a way to relax that assumption and get maybe a different result? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, we, uh, so for Laplace, uh, then we, so P is, P and Q are strongly log concave here, but maybe we mm -hmm. can get something alternative for the log concave uh, distribution. Yeah, but maybe uh, we don't consider this problem in our work, but yeah, it may be a good question. It's a, it's, it's a good question, I think, yeah. But that's why we add a L2 square regularization. So we want the P and the Q to be strongly low concave. So the classic one in this family is the Gaussian, but maybe it also can work for any other uh, low concave distribution, strong low concave distribution. Okay, maybe. Uh, so, any other question? Okay. So actually, there's another related work considering the same question, and they get uh, inequality like this. So we state our results in the language of privacy curve, and they use uh, inequality on the, to be the constraint. To compare their results and ours, uh, yeah, thanks to Gopi drawing a picture, so, uh, so the Given so fix the g over square root mu to be one, and for any delta, what's the smallest epsilon we can hope to say p and q under the same conditions are epsilon delta dp. So the smaller the epsilon, the better a privacy guarantee. So uh, one can see their bound is uh, like uh, two or three times some constant times was at least compared to ours. OK. So now I continue to talk about uh, proof of our abstract theorem. Um, so just uh, for mu to be mu strongly low concave, um, and uh, this inequality is saying, so given any set A with measure Z, uh, we, we, if we in, increase, enlarge the set A to be AR by this uh, criteria, uh, saying uh, the distance between A and AR is small by R, and uh, A is a subset of AR, of course, then we can give a lower bound on the measure of AR. Uh, phi is the standard CDF of, uh, it's the CDF standard Gaussian in case uh, you are not familiar with it. Uh, so I will draw a picture to demonstrate this inequality. So consider the one dimensional Gaussian, uh, the A is some half plan, which is left to this slash the nine and if we increase the A to AR, so we append this subset into it between two slash lines, we can uh, give a lower bound on the measure of AR. So that's exactly what we get uh, in the inequality. So the inequality is actually tight. So in high dimension, uh, you just choose A to be some half plan. So maybe just reduce the things to one dimension. So, yeah, I hope you will not the, find the mu strongly low concave measure too strange or weird as people 
add regularization terms every day. And this may be uh, our result may can be see, considered on one intuition why we need a, a regularizer. So we need a strongly low concave measure, some things. Okay. Um, now, any problem regarding the isoparametric, then I can continue. Okay, so our final goal is to prove the abstract theorem. Uh, we use, we begin uh, with isoparametric inequality and then we get this following corollary. Um, so pi is still the mu strongly long concave measure and suppose alpha is Lipschitz, uh, the mz you can treat this as some value to make the CDF to be z. And now we can bond the, give a concentration, we can bond the tail of the alpha by some, by the standard CDF of Gaussian. So actually, how? So let A to be uh, defined by this. So for A, alpha x smaller than M, and we just treat AR to uh, be the something, the com complement of the set in our inequality. Then we can lower bound the pi AR by the Lipschitz condition and isoparametric inequality. So which also give an upper bound on the tail. That's it. Uh, so I just draw a picture to demonstrate. So say R equals, when R equals to zero, uh, the probability is one minus Z. And when R uh, uh, goes larger, the bond we get in the corollary decrease quickly to zero. Yeah. So we use these concentration bonds for Lipschitz functions uh, to bond our abstract theory to get out of abstract theorem. So to recall P and Q like this is our final goal. Uh, we let alpha to be difference between F and the tilde F such that Q uh, is proportional to E to the R minus alpha times P. Uh, so alpha is G Lipschitz. So uh, we can try to use the, this corollary as alpha is G Lipschitz on the, our assumption. How? So briefly speaking, we want to up upon this term. So given P and Q, the smaller this term, the better privacy guarantee. Okay, so the maximum is achieved if the alpha is larger than epsilon, right? So because this is there is a e to the epsilon here, and we times it by e to the minus alpha. So equivalent, just rewrite it uh, for simplicity like this. Now we just use the corollary we talked to bond this. So how? Just use the concentration of alpha. So if for all x belongs to s star alpha equals to epsilon, then perfect, you get this to be zero. So you some sense, you can hopefully you can get it to be epsilon zero dp. But anyway, we cannot hope the perfect term every day. So, but we don't want the alpha to be too large. So recall, we can bond the tail of alpha. So we can bond the probability for alpha to be large, then uh, we show how to bond this term. So actually the isoparametric can bond everything by the Gaussian case. The Gaussian case is the worst case, the extreme case. So that's what we get finally in the abstract theorem. So P and Q will be at least as uh, private as two Gaussians stated there. Okay.
any problems so far? Okay. Um, so as for the utility analysis, this is a uh, standard and you don't need a strongly convex, you just need the function to be convex. Then if you sample X according to the distribution, which is proportional to E to the minus KF, you can get uh, the utility to be D over K. Uh, there are some previous results on this similar, re there are some uh, previous references with similar results, but um, the, this is quite recent, um, but this is the earliest one we can find to get a tight constant of one. So some um, previous re references lose constants uh, in the second term, the D over K term, they lose some constant. But actually uh, the proof, uh, the intuition is quite simple. So consider a simple example, where fx equals to x1 and uh, the set k is a convex cone. So if you sample proportional to e to the minus kf, then the density for fx to be r is proportional to r to the d minus one times e to the kr. Uh, so the tricky thing is that r to the d minus one, that comes from the area of the cutting plan of the cone. So the area has exponential dependence on the dimension. So by taking expectation of over the density, you can get the d over k as claimed in the lemma. Okay, so we just use the utility lemma to bound our exercise empirical risk. So actually there are two terms, the D over K comes here, the mu D square over two comes from the regular riser. Uh, it remains to choose the K and the mu uh, to be epsilon delta DP and also get the empirical risk uh, small. So we just bound the DP by two Gaussian, so we just use the analysis on Gaussian uh, to get a dependence between K and the mu, uh, taking the values back, uh, do some calculation, choose the best mu on the regular riser, you get the final bound on the DPEI. So any problems so far? Okay. So just uh, briefly recover. So we just show um, by adding a regular regular riser term on the objective function uh, and the sampling from it. So that's a sim slight modification of the classic exponential mechanism. So we show the utility and the privacy guarantee of it. So that's what we have recover recovered. Okay, so now um, there's some doc asking the question. So fine, it agrees the regime is private can handle DPERN, but if it doesn't have a good generalization ability. So maybe certainly people will use it in the machine learning node. Yeah, that's true. That's a good question. We should consider the generalization ability. So that's it. We consider the DP stochastic convex optimization. Uh, we assume there is a, some true function T dot F for some unknown distribution P over users. So the difference between the SCO and the ERM is the, uh, one, dif one biggest difference is the uh, object function we want to minimize. So here we uh, assume the N users are sampled IID from the unknown distribution P. And we 
want to minimize the true f rather than the average of n risk functions. Yeah, this is the uh, classic definition of stochastic convex optimization. In the DP setting, uh, we just want to get a private algorithm to minimize the excess, excess population loss. Okay. So when I'm talking about uh, empirical risk, I'm talking about DPEI. When I talk about population loss, uh, I'm talking about DPSCO. Okay. So the high, so actually there are some intuitions, maybe uh, some vague intuitions. So if you uh, algorithm is private, if and only if, in some sense, in some sense, it has good stability and sensitivity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some evidence supporting if you are stable, you have good stability or sensitivity, you should have good generalization ability. So does this uh, demonstrate if the algorithm is private, then it may have good generalization ability for free or something. We don't know if these um, vague intuitions work everywhere, work generally, but at least in the DP, uh, convex optimization setting, um, there's some conclusions about this. So under some assumptions, if you can solve the DPIM optimally, then you can solve DPCO optimally. So that's uh, the assumption. So, uh, so how just by a suitable modification of SGD uh, or some iterative localization approach, one can achieve the optimal excessive population loss like this. So it's actually made up of two terms. Two terms. The first term uh, is due to the generalization gap. So you can prove uh, information lower bound on it. Uh, the second term uh, is due to the DPERM. Um, that's the tight term of the DPRM. So the tight bound of X, F of DPSCO is just the maximum among these two terms. Uh, and uh, there's some uh, recent work uh, by some Google people and other people, uh, which also consider the same result question and also get some good results. But, yeah. Um, but there are still some open problems. So this is, may not be the end of the story. So first, uh, the variance of noise SGD to achieve optimal DPCO is quite complicated. Um, so moreover, uh, the same algorithm doesn't work for both DPIM and DPCO. So the DPCO, if you want to design an optimal algorithm for DPCO, it involves uh, using DPRM as some black box and uh, use it iteration by iteration, you uh, change the domain uh, to do the projection. You change the stepping size, you change the sample size, you change everything. So that's some complicated. So in some sense, if you hope to get a good empirical risk, by current analysis, you may not get a uh, good population loss, uh, vice versa. So that's a little annoying at least. And because of the complicated analysis, uh, the constant in the population loss may be large. So this motivates us to um, general light over regime to the DPSCO setting. Okay. So just as the beginning, as I mentioned in the beginning, so a simple modification 
of exponential mechanism can solve both DPM and the DPSL optimally. So the privacy bounds are optimal, uh, the uh, bounds are clean and simple. So you just, uh, there's no hidden constants. The constants are usually very small. Uh, and finally, uh, we show how to, I, we will also show how to implement the region efficiently. So just revisit here. So to achieve optimal access in empirical risk, uh, you can only use, you only need to use n square value queries to the single function. So that's the zeroth order oracle. You don't need to query like subgradient. So it has advantage over the first order oracle query in many scenarios. And as for the DPCO, we can also achieve optimal access population loss uh, can be implemented in n times mean minimum among uh, N and D value queries. And uh, we also prove uh, matching uh, in for theoretical minimax lower bound on the number of value queries. Okay, so uh, that's it. We, uh, we will not talk in the sampling in detail. So just talk about uh, results here. Now I will begin to talk about the generalization error analysis. There's no problem so far. Okay. So to bound the generalization error, um, so we suppose we can bound the Watson distance of uh, between pi d and the pi d prime first. Okay, so d and d prime are two labeling data sets. Um, and uh, pi d is just the uh, density is uh, e proportional to e to the minus uh, k times f plus the L2 square. So it's just the uh, uh, density in the region. Uh, okay, so the generalization error is defined uh, as following. Uh, so it captures how different between the true f and uh, the empirical function according to your algorithm. The second line uh, is a uh, famous result uh, in the community. So in some sense, the d and the d prime uh, are neighboring by just choose one random S with another random S prime. So with another uh, freshly sample user. So this supports the intuition we talked just now. The first line is the generalization error. The second line, you, in some sense, you can treat it as a stability. So in some sense, if your algorithm is stable, then this famous result shows you should have good generalization ability. Your generalization error should also be small. Yeah, but anyway, um, by our assumption that the function is glibsys uh, and the property of Wolfenstein, we can bound it by g times the w2 distance. And finally, suppose we can bound w2 distance here, we can get the generalization error. Okay. So uh, I will briefly introduce how do we bound the W2 later. But is, is there any problem so far for this uh, generalization bound? Okay, so I will continue. Um, so, just recall our uh, old result. So let P and Q be something like this. If F and uh, both F and the theta F are mu strongly convex, the difference between F and the theta F are G Lipschitz, 
you can show this, you can show the privacy curve between P and Q are bounded by two Gaussians like this. So as I mentioned, this in some sense saying the dispute distributions between P and Q, or the distributions P and Q are close in the distance of language of uh, privacy curve. Now we just try to change the goal. So we change one distance to another. We just try to uh, bound the Wozenstern distance between P and Q. And as a quick reminder, the W2 distance is defined by some coupling in film among the company. Okay. So the intuition is similar. Uh, we just make use that both P and Q are strongly log concave and the perturbation is Lipschitz continuous. Okay. So uh, we have another inequality, the log Sobolev. Uh, so in the world, uh, the for any P to be mu strongly log concave, for any function, you can bound the entropy of G square by its Lipschitz constants. So that's what this inequality is saying. Uh, then we can up on the entropy. So the entropy in some sense is the randomness, the maybe if it's concentrated well, the entropy should be small, something like that. There's some intuition. So how do we use this? Uh, we use this to bound the KL diversion. So our final goal is to bound the uh, W2, but we bound the KL divergence first. So we define G to be uh, Q over P. So now you see uh, the expectation of G on the uh, with with respect to to the p is equals to one, and the k l divergence is just the entropy of g. So entropy can be used a lot. It can be used to show concentration in some sense. Also, you can to bound the k l divergence here. So you bound the uh, use the log Soboli to bound it by the uh, Lipschitz constant. And uh, yeah, by some calculation and assumption that uh, f and the minus t the f is g Lipschitz, you get the KL divergence bound. Okay. Um, so we already bound the. KL divergence, now we will try to bound the Watson So this is, there's nothing complicated. We just use the transportation inequality. So I'm sorry, there are uh, so many different inequalities here. So you just uh, can bound the W2 by KL. So that's what this inequality is saying. So we just taking the values, taking the bounds we get on the KL divergence back we get the, our final bound on the W2. So one interesting is that the uh, K cancels out he, there. So no matter how large, no matter how large the K is, uh, you get the same bound on the Watson So consider P and Q to be two Gaussians and uh, you just scale it. Even if you choose the K to be um, infinitely large, both P and Q become to point mice. The W2 distance between the P and the Q is just the distance between their mean. So this Wolfenstein distance is tight. So in the world, you can treat uh, our results just showing the Gaussian uh, has it has so many uh, extreme uh, properties in the family of strongly log concave measure. Okay, so we bound the W two anyway. So recall we can bound the population. Uh, loss if we can bound the W2. 
but our final result is to bound the population loss. So we just make use the generalization error. So pi d is, yeah, as I claim, is something. Uh, oh, we want to uh, bound this population loss uh, re regarding the true f. Rewrite it. And then uh, just by some splitting, uh, we can write it in two terms. So the second term just uh, uh, excess empirical risk. The first term is just the generalization error. So we get what our bound we get is just the, the summation of these two terms. So that's how we found the population loss. Uh, so finally, we choose the right k and mu, we can get the optimal population loss. That's it. And also, yeah, it's, it will be epsilon delta dp. We choose the k and the mu under the dp constraint. That's it. So just to summarize, uh, we have shown the G Gaussian dp of our region. So we bound the privacy curve between P and Q by two Gaussians. We bound the Watson distance. Yeah. These two bonds are tight. And uh, we use the Watson distance to bond the generalization error. So I think we hope that maybe the generalization error, this stuff can, uh, so Watson can work beyond the privacy in some sense. And it can be of independent interest. So if there is if there is no further question, I will briefly talk about the efficient implementation. So let me know if you have any question. Okay. I just uh copy the table we used in the paper. So if your function is smooth, uh, you can find the other samplers maybe with better complexity or not, I don't know. But uh, if your functions are non-smooth, maybe some days you can try to find this figure, this table to find the sample you want. Um, so there are some contributions of our samplers. So the serum state is like this. Uh, we can sample from this distribution for G uh using only G square over mu with some log terms, unbiased queries to function F. So one thing good is that even if the function is the expectation over infinitely many different possibility of fi, you just need to query one random fi in each step. So if you see uh, if the function is the summation of some structure, the O, the Oracle O needed to query the f itself rather than the single uh, information about fi. So that's one advantage of our sample. The second is that that's our sample is the first uh, sample uh, which has polylog dependence on both dimension D and the TV distance eta. So just a quick reminder, uh, they all get some D dependence on D or so the recent one needed to be one over delta if the total variation distance is smaller than delta. So that's mm -hmm. two. Uh, advantages of our sample. So we also prove a nearly matching nova bound on the number of queries, well, which is only off by some log terms. So that's the result about our sampling. So implementing our sampling results, uh, we just get the 
bound we claim before. So we can use only n square queries to solve DPIM and this n times, so the minimum between n square and n times d queries for solving DPSCO. We also prove a matching lower bound information, theoretical lower bound for the DPSCO in the language of uh, query complexity. So you, you need this, you necessarily need these queries to solve DPSCO. There's one question we find maybe interesting and important. So can we do this using only linear grid queries? So if the functions are smooth, people know how to uh, do DPSCO with only linear grid queries. But without the smooth assumption, uh, current SOTA is a little complicated. There are five terms. Uh, you should uh, choose the best term in these five, uh, among these five terms, uh, depending on the dimension and the, the data size. So that's very annoying and that we don't believe this is the end of the story. So another immediate question is that, can, as the classic exponential mechanism can work beyond convexity, our results can, can our results be generalized to non-convex case? So for example, only assume the function to be Lipschitz but not necessarily convex. So I feel we can definitely get something past. The problem is how strong the result will be. Um, and uh, uh, as a quick extension, in the new work with uh, Gopi and Intet and also some other people, uh, we can generalize our results into non-Euclidean settings so that we can define the Lipschitz constant and the strong convexity with respect to any other node. So in this talk, we only focus on the L2 Norm, so we can generalize our results to any other norm. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>